the nine years podcast. All right, everybody. Episode 57 of the Nine Years Podcast. Nick Draper and Stuart Deacons here. A pair of us were voted Best Presenters of an AFC Wimbledon Podcast 2016 by readers of Pod Magazine. That might be a lie. Stu, how are you this week? Fantastic. I am fantastic too. Why? Because this week we are joined by Ryan Sweeney on the show. Still in his early days as a Stoke City player. Going to be a strange one for me this week, having taught Ryan as a teenager, well, when he was a teenager, it's not when I was, that wouldn't work. And I haven't been a teenager since, hmm, what, 2011? Stu, do you remember life as a teenager? Reckon you must have been a bit of a teddy boy. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago, to be fair, but I do remember my days as a teenager, and, um, yeah, it all seemed a long while, all seemed a, a long while ago now. Top seven list this week? Yeah, I've gone, obviously, I thought I'd go with something topic, so, you know, with, with Brian being at Stoke City, so I haven't gone for anything with Stoke, so I couldn't think of anything. I've gone for top cities. Top cities? It's top cities. Cities that some I've been to and some that I'd love to go to. Go on then. Yeah, so no particular order. Uh, Barcelona. Obviously. London. Mm-hmm. New York. Mm-hmm. Sydney. Manchester, love Manchester. I love place, Manchester. Yeah, place sure where we got place where we got promoted. Yeah, big Manchester um, fan. Exactly. Vancouver, and finally, after my time working with Canon, Tokyo. Did you ever go to Tokyo? No, but it's a place I'd love to go. We um we had quite a few um of sort of Japanese um people come over from from Japan, of course, because they're sort of Japanese. Japanese people from <laughs> Japan. Let's clear that one up now. Yeah. Classic, and they're just such lovely people. And I know quite a few people that went over to Tokyo, and they said the culture was amazing. So it's one of my thing. If I, you know, I want to do a bit more traveling, um, Tokyo would be a place I would want to go. Although I just don't know whether I could eat anything over there because, of course, I don't know if I've got Mackey D's or KFC because I don't really fancy eating some sort of like snake that they pick for you. Do you remember going to Carlisle United away, Stu, where I was wearing a T-shirt with the word Tokyo on, and an old boy <laughs> stopped me and asked me, "What's it like over there?" I've not been there for... I've been there 30 years ago. It's an amazing uh, place. That was classic. Yes, I do. That was when we went into a pub and we were trying to watch football and then we realised it was some old man's pub that they were putting a bracing on. Um, and I left you alone now, mate, because I saw exactly what he was going to do and I thought, I can't really help on this one. It was like a scene out of the 80s, wasn't it, where every single man in that pub had a flat cap, a copy of the Racing Post under his arm, and even though smoking is banned in pubs, I swear all you could see was smoke. Uh, but Carlisle, to be fair, it's one of the gutting things that getting sort of promoted is that we can't go to Carlisle because Carlisle is one of the best places to get by train, has the best fish and chips, and it's just, um, yeah, it's great, Carlisle. I wish we could over get him in the cup. We're going to disagree about best fish and chips. That's clearly at Fleetwood Town, but... We what, should... the, the one opposite the away end? Yeah. No, Carlisle's better. Well, we'll have to agree to disagree for the time being because I have my top seven list to get to. This week I've gone for my top seven films that have a body part in the title. Run through these very quickly. Edward Scissorhands. The Hills Have Eyes. Happy Feet. The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. The Empire Strikes Back. Don Nee Darko. Finally, The Usual Suspects. (laughs) I like that. That's quite good. The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Have you ever seen that? That's the scariest film ever. No, I don't watch horrors. Well, no. Well, you watched Watford on the the other day. I did, do either. That was a great horror. No, I don't see the point. I don't see the point of watching something that's going to scare me um, or pay someone to scare me. I'd rather pay someone to like, cheer me up. So I, I love comedies, to be fair, rather than um, rather than horrors. You've been watching our Defending All Season. You've been paying for that one. That's why I fancy a laugh this season. Hi, I'm John Green, and when I watch Wimbledon play, I like to see them play in their traditional yellow and blue kit, or really anything other than the green-on-green stripes. As we mentioned, Ryan Sweeney on the show this week, along with all the usual features. We'll be looking ahead to our games against Shrewsbury and Coventry City. Poly on go, the Lone Watch, and, of course, finally, the result of our Gold of the Month vote. But first, let's look at the Charlton game from Saturday. Stu, possibly the greatest game of football ever played, the greatest AFC Wimbledon away game ever 
in history, featuring the best goal ever scored by a Wimbledon slash AFC Wimbledon player. What did you make of the game on Saturday? You're so not funny, Nick. <laughs> did you enjoy it? To be fair, from from my sofa, I was celebrating like a, a five year old would celebrating being given a box of a box of samaris or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's, the, that's the best metaphor we've ever had. Yeah, first thing come to my head. Um, yeah, I was. Um, I couldn't read. Really, uh, first off, I went out for a walk because I just don't like listening to. Um, I read a WDN's great and stuff like that, but I just can't listen to a radio. Um, cause I have no idea where the ball is. And I get a little bit. Oh, I'm not too sure. Um, so yeah, I didn't really. Um, I saw him when I was down, and then the second half was really Twitter. Um, keep an eye on it, and then I sort of saw him. I saw him made the subs, and I, from then I thought. Do you know what? We've got a chance here, but I didn't think we'd um, end up winning the game. Now, before I speak more about Saturday's trip to John, I just have to say, your phrasing about the box of Smarties thing, I might have said that was a metaphor. Now, somebody is going to be really picky and say, actually, Nick, that's a simile. So I just have to say that before somebody gives me grief, namely my brother, probably, which is ironic, him picking up on my grammar. Anyway, Charlton. So, first thing I have to ask is you, have you got any news as to exactly why James Shea was recalled to the starting lineup ahead of Ryan Clark? No. Totally surprised me. Um, it's a weird one, isn't it? Because what were we, seven games, we were in seven games in, what were we, eight games now after Charlton. Um, so it seems no sense, you know, it's like sometimes you hear about um, managers saying we'll give you ten games or five games or stuff like that, but, you know, I thought, to be fair, he did okay against Sheffield United. I didn't really think he was at fault for a million of goals. I thought he'd done well. Just seemed a really weird time to, to change. There's loads, there's, there's loads of things you could you, you could say. There's Neil Hardy openly said on the Don's Play interview after the Charlton game that in the week on Tuesday they had a heart to heart and a few things were said. Um, didn't say what was said, but it was interesting. Uh, Don Polion and um, Barnett also alluded to things were said that needed to be said. So you, you don't know what was said, but obviously not. They weren't happy things, were they? And then they said they had a cracking week of training. So you can only really assume that from that Tuesday, James Shea has just had an excellent week training. And maybe maybe Clark hasn't. Um, but it seemed a weird change, but ultimately paid off massively, didn't it, for us? Yeah, well, arguably, and we'll come to this later, but James Shea was our best performer on the day and certainly justified his selection. And, you know, I've seen the Don's player, the, um, the 10 minutes highlights, which is excellent viewing. And to be fair, James, James Shea, we've, we've said this many a time before, a shot stopper, there isn't many better that I've seen in the league too. Um, and that's exactly what he did on Saturday, wasn't it? His shot stopping, uh, low down at his feet was just, um, was excellent, wasn't it? Yeah. And I was love to see the second half save he made, you say down to his right, I think we just tipped it around post fingertips. It looked at from the away end. I've not seen it back, but it was an outstanding, save from where I was. Do you think it does engender that confidence then in the in the back four? I think it does. I think you know, again we you know, we were very happy with Clark and goal and we we we've assumed you'd been there for a little while. So there's no real it's difficult when a keeper you don't think a keeper's done anything on the previous game to lose his place. Um so it's a difficult one and it'd be interesting to see how Nuwadi dealt with talking to him to let him know because he always says that he doesn't just let people um, view a team sheet and they're, they're, they're not playing and stuff. He likes to explain why they're not playing. So would love in time to, to come to see why that was the case. Um, what I did love with James Shea after the game was that he he openly admitted that he was nervous and said, "Yeah, there was nerves." But after once he got his first touch and he was he was okay. And to be fair to him, he said that he was really hoping the game would finish because Charlton were a good team. Um, but the thing I loved about him and the difference between him and Ryan Clark is, is that James Shea openly come out and said, I want to keep my place. I know now I've got to play well, I've got to train well, and I want to keep my place. Whereas Ryan Clark sometimes comes a little, across a little bit more reserved, a little bit more closed, do you know what I mean? And, um, no, James Shea seemed really, really happy. And, um, I'm hoping that he, I'm hoping that he does have a, a good couple of games because we need that competition with the goalkeepers. Um, and if James Shea is training really hard and up in his game, then, you know, we have a good goalkeeper there. We we know that from, from previous. All that said, we did give away another shocking goal. Nothing to do with the goalkeeper, but the pressure on the ball as Lookman for Charlton. Great surname. Wasn't there a magazine that used to be called that? Lookman or Lookin. Lookin magazine, that was it. Um, <laughs> yeah. He just cuts inside far too easily. Sells Barry Fuller a dummy. Barry loses his footing. We don't close him down. It's a fairly simple finish in the end. We were thinking it was going to be a long, hard game after that. Charlton seemed to ease off, though, 
if we're being very honest, they did create a number of chances. Obviously, James Shea had to perform very, very well, number of saves to make. But watching that first half, there was never a great amount of sustained pressure. In fact, I would say that we had the majority of possession. We didn't do anything with it. But the tempo of the game and things like that, we never felt like concerned that we were being hammered, do you know what I mean? Or yeah. the goals are going to be scored. They did seem to just kind of sit behind the ball and say, we're confident that you're not going to be able to get past us. Was that similar? Russell Slade, he was in charge of Charlton, wasn't he? When, uh, Charlton, sorry. Cardiff, when we played them in the League Cup last season, didn't we? And it was yeah. a similar vibe sort of then. Yeah, it was. Um, the thing is, in this league, I have to Especially against us, we are probably New Ardley. If you look at tactically and his, his use of subs, um, he's excellent. You know, he's always if 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 you're in one goal of a team, we all know what he's going to do. He's going to chuck through or three fours on the on and play three up front. This time, he thought he'd go for broke even more and went with four. Um, maybe George Franken, you know, Paul is you know basically made him make that extra sub. We don't know. Um, you know, some people said that you know the, the reason we won the game is because George Franken got injured. You know, in a, in a roundabout way. Obviously, we're not we're not um, glorifying in terms of George getting injured. But some people were sort of saying that it only happened that way because George got injured and it forced Neil's arm. But I always think George um, Neil Ardy was going to go that way um, and chuck four up. Um, it's interesting. Just quickly go back. You know that Charlton goal that I that they scored is interesting when I look back at it because I didn't really think Barry Fuller was too much at fault because if you looked at the goal. Um, uh, Dominic Polion gets back and if you look at when it, when you double up normally you're trying to push someone the way you want them to go if you look at Dominic Polion he literally just stands in front of Barry Fuller and literally doesn't make him go anywhere <laughs> all he does is gets in Barry Fuller's way it was really it was really interesting looking at that defensive side because really what you really want to do is push him out wide whereas Don Polion Reed really just showed him in, showed him inside and then he kept going inside and inside and Barry Fuller's doing some sort of can-can behind him, isn't he, really? <laughs> to... A really bad version of the can-can. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's just interesting how you look at goals sometimes and I know I, I, I was looking and people said, oh, Barry Fuller's mistake, but I didn't really think it was, for being truthful. Um, yeah, you wonder whether Charlton have got, sort of going on to your point, I wonder if Charlton have actually got um, that killer instinct or whether... Because at one nil, the game's not the game is not over, especially against us. You know, we chuck four forwards on, go for it, we go long, um, and I'd imagine from what I'm what I'm hearing, the game changed instantly, didn't it? It's just a case of having more numbers up front to support, so the ball's going to stick more often up front. Do you know what I mean? We can get players then to link in. That's the main difference. We started with uh, it was a it was more of a four five one in the end. Lars Taylor was so isolated up top. To be honest, I think. Most of us would have been able to call that that was going to be what happened when the team was announced. Yeah. What do you think the thinking was? What do you think Neil's thinking was there with the playing Lyle up front? Was it surely, was he thinking that we'd get something on the break, we, if we stayed nice and solid and used the pace in behind? Was that the idea? Because the 4 5 one, you can imagine that Danny Borman was actually sort of between the lines, if you know what I mean, sort of a holding midfield, more of a 4 1 4 1. It's a weird one, isn't it? Because sometimes, yeah, if we're going to play a four-five-one in the traditional four-five-one formation, Lyle Taylor doesn't fit the bill of being the the link forward. Just doesn't. Um, you wonder sometimes whether it was four-five-one can easily turn to a four-three-three when you're attacking. I suppose you, as long as you get your numbers forward. Yeah, if you get uh, numbers forward, exactly. Yeah, if you don't retain, if you don't retain possession enough, then you tend to end up being a four-five-one, and then your players become um, too far away from each other to make an impact. So you wonder whether maybe the plan was to really get numbers around Lyle and you know if Charlton had more possession then yeah it's very easy to become isolated I think I don't think Lyle is the, is the right man to play in a 4-5-1 I think um, Barnett or Elliot is the perfect one to do it. Barnett probably more because if you're going to knock the ball to Barnett the ball's going to more nine times out of ten it's going to stick um, so it's interesting how he's going to do he, he has alluded that he's, he, he may have to drop you know, he may have to go away from his four four two and play the four five one. If he does, then I don't see how Lyle Taylor plays in a four five one. And maybe he found that out on Saturday. Yeah, in that setup with that formation, Charlton quite have to sit back. We clearly just didn't have the either the confidence or the quality to break them down, try and create an opening, passing the ball so slowly, misplacing a number of passes. The only player that I think we looked to perhaps getting us something was Dominic Polion. We couldn't get him in a situation to affect things and Obviously, as you say, substitutions, formation change, that did the trick. We talk about yeah. having individual quality that every team seems to have, and we say maybe we don't have the individual quality, but then Don Polion turns up in the second half with a goal of insane quality. 
Ah, uh, it's just brilliant, isn't it? And and where we just said about the first goal, where we conceded, where we showed we showed the striker in, inside. Um, that goal was interesting, wasn't it? Because then Charlton defenders got very close together, as if to snipe him out. And he finds he nutmegs he nutmegs one of the defenders and then goes through and the slot under the keeper. The keeper's a big keeper, you know. They they rate this keeper highly um, in terms of he's on. Is he on loan? Is that right? I'm trying to think now, but I, I hear lots of good things about Rudd. Um, he was he's a great good, in Anchorman. <laughs> Might be a different one. He's a good keeper. He's a good keeper, and to be fair, he's a big keeper as well. And then the place that big keepers don't like it is between their legs. Say that again. That. Yeah, the the place is big. Big goalkeepers don't like the ball slotted in between their legs. That sounds really dodgy, doesn't it? But anyway, that's one going to go with. Say it one more time. <laughs> no, so now you're going to try and record a snippet from that. No. But it's <laughs> it's a great bit of individual skill, and um, I think we're starting to see now. You know, one of um, if you listen to Oldham fans and even Don Pallion himself has said that he was always played out wide. Players put players a four five one, not really played in the position that he. He needs to be effective, and we are now. We're playing him in, you know, we're playing him for twos or threes up front, and um, the guy is very be- quick, quickly becoming a, a terrace favourite. I'm no shaking doubt. my head. He is a terrace favourite. I'm just not singing that song. I still refuse and what, to, and what, and, and to be fair, Nick, I know you've been moaning about this quite a lot. What is the song? What is the song that, he, that he's got? A very bad one that I will not repeat here. <laughs> but Joe, you know we said this. We said this early on, didn't we, Joe? We've had some real sort of like crowd favourites who've never had songs for like years. Yeah, Don Polion. I suppose it's the name, isn't it? It sort of goes with a lot of things. I but think it um, scans into a chant that already exists. Yeah, but then all chants exist from somewhere, don't they? Joe, you know I mean, you know, the one of the you know, he's one of our own that Harry Kane was nicked off. You know, it all started somewhere. Um, yeah, do you know what? The moment of brilliance and um, the guy is very, very confident. Even when he celebrates, he looks confident that, well, that's it. You know, as Lyle would say, that's what you pay me to do. Yeah. Um, what else do you expect? Yeah, Polon is just um, a handful at the moment. And um, I don't think there's any other starter really at the moment. It's got to be Polion and one other, isn't it, at the moment? Definitely. Tyrone Barnett states his claim by scoring the winning goal. Barry Fuller, the moment that ball left his foot, it was like, wow, what a cross that is just begging someone to knock it in and yeah then the euphoria that followed it's a great ball it's a great ball and um, it just shows you sometimes you haven't got to beat a man to get across him you know you just put it into an area the thing that I loved about it although they look- do say to you to be the man you've got to beat the man <laughs> maybe of course one thing I loved about it when I watched a goal is that if you look at, we, we sometimes moan that we don't get bodies into the box. So, you know, when Lyle comes out wide or, or anything like that. But if you look at when the cross goes in, there's three in the six yard area, you know, front, middle and back. So the cross, to be fair, he chucks it in an area and in the end he went centre, um, and, and Barnett was all over his centre half and knocked it into the roof of the net. But, I was really impressed how many numbers we got into the box. And um, it's becoming a bit frustrating that we sort of know that we're going to start, you know, Don Polon said it in the Don's player interview, it's about time now we start leading games and closing games out rather than having to recover and go free up front. You do wonder why, I just wish we'd go, like, you know, Shrewsby at home and we're going to come to a build-up, aren't we, in a little while. But let's just go for it. Let's just chuck, let's play 4-3-3 three, three and just have them... This just this match them, do you know what I mean, rather than doing the second half. Last couple of bits I'll touch on from Charlton on Saturday. Obviously, two shots on target, two goals. Always lovely to see that. Flares. This was a topic of conversation that came up on social media following the game. A smoke bomb was let off following one of the goals. I can't remember which one now, to be honest with you. Raised a debate amongst Wimbledon fans. They are, of course, banned from stadiums. It's interesting that it got into the stadium, considering I was body searched on the way in, as I know many others were. Somehow they managed to miss the smoke bomb. I don't personally have an issue with them. Quite like the look of them, but I understand the health implications. Where do you stand on the issues, Joe? Well, to be fair, firstly, I'm glad you expanded on what you meant by flares. So I was thinking, crikey, fashion. You know what I mean? What's going on about that? Those, those, about... They were the things when you got to about your forties <laughs> in, in the seventies. Flares, flares are back in. I'm like, wow. Okay, yeah. Um, it's been truthful. I don't know, you know, it makes me laugh. We, we've seen them a few times now, haven't we? We've seen it. The thing that makes me laugh is, was it Sheffield United had them? Was that right? Sheffield United had it in the most smallest way end you're going to have. If you've got people with asthma, they're going to struggle straight away. Um, I've, not been, I've not been around a flare when it's been let off, so I'm not obviously too sure what the... Well, you say that. I was thinking back to flares, and I was thinking, do you remember Fisher in the playoff semi-final? Because I was thinking of the most tragic use of a flare I've ever experienced. <laughs> 
Did we have one then? We did. We were 2 0 down and we scored to make it 2 1. And yeah, somebody I thought, am, let's me. let off a flare at <laughs> Champion Hill in Dulwich. <laughs> oh, to be so, fair, they're probably used to that sort of stuff around that area anyway, do you know what I mean? Oh, so, yeah, impossible. Yeah, <laughs> definitely smoke, but. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think you're right. You know, if you've got people with asthma and breathing difficulties, then it's crazy. And I hear, I hear something that it was under someone's seat or ended up in someone to someone's seat who was asthmatic, which, yeah, that's stupid. Um, I don't know. They look, it's weird, isn't it? You know, you look at like um, games on the continent and that, and there's always flares everywhere, isn't there? Do you know what I mean? Uh, it seems to be very sort of like picturesque, but I think, you know, if it's, if it is making people struggle to breathe and uh, stuff like that, then we should really be, um, well, that's why they're banned. That is why they are banned. Some of our fans were banned in terms of, banned from entering the ground on Saturday because they were carrying protest cards against the Charlton owner, Roland Dutcher. Yeah, what I would up. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting closer. Uh, Charlton <laughs> was staging protests on Saturday. If I'm going to be honest, not particularly noticeable to us in the away end, although leaving the stage in, and before the game, you did see a number of fans in black and white protest shirts, black and white scarves were on evidence. Attendance was about 11,000. And people were asking for official merchandise to be boycotted and things like that. Looking around from the fans travelling to and from the game seems to be a little bit of a divide. Not doesn't seem to be a serious split. You know, I'm not saying fans are butting heads or anything, but it seems to be a number of fans not adhering to that. And they're going to struggle in their protests if they're not a united front, aren't they? Yeah, I sort of looked at the attendance and I noticed that it was just under, just short of 12,000. So, yeah, what would we take? 700. So, you've got 10,000 fans in there. I've not looked at their average for the last season or what they were getting previously. But, yeah, you've got to have a united front. I, from what I understand, they've got their own programme. Is that right? So, they're asking to boycott that. They're boycotting, boycotting merchandise. It's difficult to know. It depends what this, this person's in it for. Do you know what I mean? Because some of the decisions they've made defy logic, do you know what I mean? And um, Charlton is a Charlton is a club that's very in touch with his community. You know, it's one that we obviously, you know, we all gate crash Palace and they ended up going back to the valley. It's a lovely ground now. You have to wonder what what do they want to do with Charlton because they're no longer a championship club. They need to get back into that. They don't particularly look to me like they're spending loads and loads of money to do it. I think they spent decent money on this on the strike force to be fair. What have you got? So you've got um, a Jose who come in, you've got... Um, McGuinness or McGuinness. Um, McGuinness, the one that Cardiff, um, that Neil Hardy um, saw as a goalkeeper and then put him as a forward. I don't know, it, it, it doesn't look like to me you loads of money. You know, I look through that squad and I don't see like your Sheffield United, your Boltons, and you know, your Scunforts, to be fair. So you wonder what their business model is in terms of what are they looking to do. Um, because I can't... Obviously, you saw Charlton on Saturday... I can't see them being up the top end of the table this year. Difficult one to judge. They had a lot of quality in that first half, to be fair. You can see some quality going forward. Jose probably had a quiet game, to be fair, but we know what he's capable of. Midfield looked pretty decent, to be fair, but as you say, there's a lot of strong teams in this division as well, so maybe they'll be pushing top half by the end of it. But Charlton, if you want to know more about Charlton, I did put an article about their situation on our website, 9yrspodcast.org. To have read that, check that out. Links there to the cam. I always call it the campaign against, it's not, it's the coalition against Roman de B- <laughs> <laughs> And You can check that out as well. What a name, isn't it? You know what I mean? And the thing is, the, the funny thing is, foreign ownership. Foreign ownership in League One does it really need a foreign owner? Rounding up Saturday's game then, Don's three-word match reports, hashtag Don's three-word reports. Loads of these this week, and honestly, huge thank you to everyone for taking part. Please keep them coming in. I know we only we can only read out three every week, but we do enjoy reading them all. Please just make sure you are using that hashtag, hashtag Don's three-word report. We do manage to catch the ones without the hashtags, but, well, as many as we think we can. I'm sure there are some we've missed, though, so please make sure you've got that hashtag in. This week, I have gone... I have selected the three, starting off with Hannah Kitcher at Han Kitcher. It's gone for season-defining win. The We Are Wimbledon account at All Things AFCW, Shay Our Saviour, and my personal favourite at FC Wimbledon, the FC Wimbledon Twitter account. Wombles Crack Addicts. Very yeah. Clever. Very That's good, isn't it? That is good. That is good. That's the winner this week. Lots of you went for smash and grab, obviously, with our two shots, two goals. We went ourselves at Nine Wireless Podcast. We went for Glee Shaped Valley. I thought that was very good. 
but a couple of people I spoke to didn't get it. So no, I'm struggling. It's a geographical term. It's like a, a V, instead of a V-shaped valley, and we're playing at the valley, it's a glee-shaped valley because we won. Uh, too technical. Man of the match. We reduced it to two options this week. Uh, myself and George Jones, member of the podcast team, plumped for a straight choice between Dominic Polion and James Shea. No one else was going to win it, let's be honest. And it was a very, very tight run thing. 97 votes. James Shea won with 52%. In my head, I reckon that's about 50 votes to 47. So thank you very much for taking part. And keep an eye out for all of those on Twitter following the game with Shrewsbury on Saturday. It's really interesting, isn't it? We're getting quite a good um, response now to our man match polls. Um, and the thing I loved also is that, obviously, because I'm at home and Twitter, obviously, was just going mad. Um, those three word uh, match reports, literally, I think the first one come in within like five seconds of the final whistle going. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, really, really pleasing with that. It's sort of taking off now. So, um, Kitten coming in. And um, Nick, try a bit harder with not doing some technical stuff next time on our one. You know the next one I do, I'm going to make it really technical and really obscure now. <laughs> yeah, I know you will. Goal of the month for August. The voting closed. We had votes running on Twitter and Facebook and by email as well. Huge thank you again to Mark Hendricks at cuttingitfinefilms.com com for putting together the video clear winner though with 92 percent of the vote Stu, who do you think won the vote uh, to be fair it was only one goal wasn't it the only bartram versus bowen yeah i didn't want it was indeed 92 percent of the vote and second place do we have a second place was there anyone that voted at once yeah lyle taylor was second place with a, about four four percent of the vote and that was against peterborough away so i think there might have been a goal in the Checker Trade EFL trophy against Swansea on 23 that a few votes came in for, but I think people sw- shied away from voting for that one because mm. of the nature of the competition it was in. And do you know what? To be fair, I didn't vote for any Bartrams because I knew that I'd win it. So I thought, well, I'm not going to go for that. I actually went for the um, near post, sorry, the front post header by Workdown. Because I, I quite liked it. I like the old near post flick. I think it's quite, if you can, if set pieces, I love set pieces. So if you can get the run across the defender and flick it in the top corner, I think it's a great goal. So that's what I went for. Fantastic. Good old school Wimbledon set piece goal. <laughs> I think that's what it is. It's old school, isn't it? John Green here. Thanks for listening to today's show. And don't forget to be awesome. Ryan Sweeney of Premier League Stoke City has joined us on the show this week. We're just having a quick chat with Ryan, and apparently, Ryan, you've never Googled yourself before. No. Well, yeah, on occasion, but it's more other people telling me. You know, if you're on Wikipedia, it's always it's always a plus, isn't it? So. It's always a bonus. You think you've made a Wikipedia? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've never hit the big time. So um, you're joining us from Stoke. Whereabouts are you exactly at the minute, then? So whereabouts are you just, living at the moment? Just in a um, hotel until I can get a place sorted out. I'm just currently in the in the process of getting it done, so hopefully um, that should happen soon. So just settling in now. Um, so yeah, it's going well. Though. What are you looking um, to do? You looking, well, to, looking to buy somewhere? You looking to, are you getting enough money? Being paid just, enough money at Stoke to buy a place, or is it? No. Uh, <laughs> well, not yet. No, just um, looking to rent a flat um, about twenty-five minutes from the training ground. So it's it's not too bad. It's a nice little area called uh, Stone. So yeah, no, it's nice. Nice. What hotel are you in? Is it a Premier Travel Lodge? Is it a... Just a holiday in. So, Ryan, I was just thinking, you know, Nick and I know you joke, joke about going up north and surely you must be able to buy a place up there in Stoke. Can't be, um, you know, should be able to get about £50, £50 or something? That's a bit gen- that is a bit generous, I think, but... It's <laughs> <laughs> quite nice. So you are you far... So I think when I, we've been up there before, like, it's very close to... When we went to Port Vale, I remember seeing Stoke. Sort of, it's quite close there, isn't it? Sort of Port Vale way, is that right? Yeah, I've, to be fair, when I've I've been in this uh, hotel, saw uh, South End were in here when they played Port Vale, so I don't think it could be too far from it. Cool. So have you found it? Have you found it being in a hotel? So it must be what August you went up there, is that right? Yeah, just the start of August. So um, yeah, no, I think it's just something to get used to. Really, I mean, it's not ideal, really, but um, yeah, no, so I just got used to it and. Um, I'll be probably out of here soon, so I'll just I'll hang on for maybe a couple more weeks, and I'll be I'll be out of here. So, <laughs> well, as you say, you've been up there now for what, about a month now, should we say? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. We've got loads to ask you about in terms of your move to right, Stoke, yeah. but what I kind of want to focus on to begin with 
you just want to roll back the years, as it were, even though, yeah. even though, what are your age? What are you now? 22? No, 19. Still 19. <laughs> oh, yes. wow. My death at the time is shocking. Right, okay. Yeah, that's terrible, that is. That is really better than that. Anyway, so 19 still. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think back to when you first would have joined Wimbledon. How old would you have been when you first joined? I think it was around about uh, seven or eight I was. About eight, yeah. Okay, and then was that training or playing where the training ground is currently or were we elsewhere at the time? Yeah, I think um, it was down... uh, I remember my first game I went down to, it was um, just down at Tiffin Girls, I think it was. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah, and and, um, it was on the field over there and... I just knew there was a trial going on because um, we got in touch with uh, Tony Wilson. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, we just went down there and then it just, yeah, just went on from there, really. So that's how it all started for me. That was my first experience for AFC Wimbledon, yeah. Did you trial as a centre-half? Were you always a centre-half? or was it? No, do you know what? I was at Seven aside, I was actually a midfielder. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously, as as we went up to like 11 aside and the pitch got bigger and I got slower... It got, um, <laughs> it just put, and just the that, just the height thing as well. I was, I was growing as well, so I just ended up going uh, centre half, and then just went on from there, really. And you were comfortable, you were comfortable there. I mean, you're always left footed, so was it a case of just slotting in quite nicely as the sort of left sided centre half, where often teams might struggle to find, fill that role? Yeah, I think that was another thing as well because I was uh, left footed, and there was a lot, obviously a lot of right footers in the side, and obviously. Um, we had Ben Harrison there as well, who was a defender, and then he obviously was left back. And then, as as time went on, obviously I said like we went when I went to eleven aside, um, well, I just went left centre half, and then it, we had a nice little balance in the back as well. I think that's why we done so well. So I was I was looking back, and I'm, when you signed, yeah, I looked at you signed in um, two thousand and five, aged eight. We were we were in the Ryman Premiership under Dave yeah. Anderson back then. Yeah. Um, how do things change? Because bearing in mind, we sort of, um, you know, sort of rolled on sort of six years later, we, we got the academy sort of rating the, the category three. Yeah. How how did it change in terms of the academy? Because obviously, as you went up the levels, how did it change? Because, you know, we sort of said it was very much sort of like a not professional leagues and stuff. How did it change you as you were getting older? Yeah, well, it, it was it's obviously a bit like crazy when you when you think about it. Like when we were actually in the Ryman League, then... Um, we actually went to some of the games as well, and it just it was it was a massive change. And obviously, as we um, as we progressed on eleven aside and our team, you know, we, we became like a very good like Sunday league. Team. We were obviously, I think we were the best around them, um, certainly in the country. I thought anyway, I don't think anyone could really could really doubt that. Um, and then we you know we used to play academy sides, and we used to we used to beat them, and they used to say how good we were, and then. Obviously, when we got um, the Category 3 status and Willington Academy Football, it wasn't too much of a difference because we, we we knew we could play against them sort of sides and do really well. And then we ended up doing really well, to be fair. Um, so, yeah, no, it was... Um, the transition was, was actually... It weren't, weren't too bad. We had, like, a really good, a really good side when we were younger and we all progressed the foot, uh, very well. And, obviously, quite a few of us ended up signing professional contracts. And I think that, that stemmed from the early years really so do you think yeah. then you mentioned there sort of the academy teams and Wimbledon side doing really well against more established sides and of yeah. course there was the link of consistency with teams going through the age groups with them but in terms of the setup at AFC Wimbledon do you not think a lot of the way we go about our youth and our academy system is just so professionally done and so well looked after we does help us overachieve maybe for the resources we have no definitely I think that was another thing that's what I think we were so successful as well. I think because like, we done, we did everything right um, from like a young age, and obviously as it progressed, you know, you go through to you know Mark Robinson. If you, if anyone ever works with him, you know, it's it's brilliant. Like what he does, you know, he's Mark's like really meticulous in like his planning, and and it started like from early, really. You know, um, all like the things we were doing when we were younger. I think stemmed stem from them sort of things and um, you know I think it's just it's clear to see really like how many players that have been brought through the system and have gone on to make debuts or get on the bench or whatever um, so so yeah I mean obviously as well there's like myself and and like Dan Adji Will Mannion have moved on to, to Premier League clubs as well uh, recently so I think it just goes to show that something's obviously being done right there and obviously we'll make that continue
So in terms of what age did you what age did you get to meet Mark Robinson? Because obviously I know he does the under 18s. Do you very much until you get into that team, or does he does he look under 15s and stuff like yeah. that? Yeah, no, I think I, I think I was I was about twelve, I think eleven, twelve when I first actually met Mark. You know, he's um he always I think he lo- he loves like going down to watch the the younger the younger teams as well because he's he's always planning for the future. Um, so that's, that's another that's another really good thing about Mark. You know, he's, he's always interested in how the young groups are doing. You know, he knows all the players as well. And I, I remember like when we were under eighteens. Um, he used to get the like the younger lads. I can't I can't really think of what age they were. Like they were they were like young lads. They used to, they used to come in and and like watch us play and write down notes and he gets them to do things like that. So it's brilliant. Like what's what's he what he's um, doing with all the academy and stuff and now it's being run. It's, it's fantastic. And when when you're down your team, I've, um, we've got to be fair. We're, we're arranging an interview with um, with Mark soon, actually. Yeah. Um, sort of go through the academy, but I've been down there a couple of times this season. Um, was fortunate enough to sort of um, be able to stand behind him when he was doing some coaching. That. Yeah. Does he, in terms of the game, is it about? I'm mean, just to say, is it about winning with him or is it about developing? How is he? You know, if you're losing, for I would say, I don't know. To be fair, I don't think you lost too much, but you know, if you're losing, is he yeah. more thing about your 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 sort of more about teaching how to play the game rather than winning um, being the all and end all to, at, at any age um, like especially like the the under 18s um, you know you always want to win uh, no matter what game it is um, you always want to get that winning mentality it's you know because it's it's the best thing in football to win in the game that's what, that's what we play it for but at the end of the day it's um, especially Mark he, he, he hated losing uh, Robbo did, but if you know if you've done if you've done things right in the game and and you've played well, he, um, he obviously he loved it. He took it as a positive. But if there was things to work on, you know, he'd always he'd always go back and look look at games and see what things we could work on. So with it, I don't think it's the be and end all under eighteen football. But obviously, you, you do want to win games. But as long as you're progressing in the right manner and he can see progress, and especially like New Ardley and all the coach staff can see progress, you know, I think. Uh, that's the main thing there. In terms of your progress, at what sort of age group do you think the idea that you could perhaps be aiming for a first team spot, a full time professional contract, when did that become a real, really realistic prospect for you? Um, well, I saw my scholarship, I think, when I was 15. Um, and then once you get into the under 18s, I think the first year, you know, always trying to find your feet with like going full time in football because it's, it's a massive change because we used to go to school and then go train a couple of times a week. But when you're actually in that environment, um, of full time football, you know, it is a lot different. I think, um, I played 21s when I was, um, like a first year and then second year, you know, I, I played 21s, uh, for the whole season. And then once I started, um, and then there was one day when I got in the squad for the first time. Um, I thought then like that was when you know I could you know maybe they are looking at me um, to make like really kick on and stuff. Um, so yeah, I think when I got really got in around there, started training with the first team and and I got and I got in the squad for the first. I think that was when I really thought you know maybe there's a chance here. And, um, yeah, it progressed like that from there, really. So how did you find, in terms of you saying you first get into a squad, I know when Neil Ardy talks about the youth players now, he basically says that they they, he train, they train with the first team anyway, so they sort of integrate well. So yeah. when you when you were going to a squad, was it really, was it in terms of you weren't really getting to know the players for the first time? Did you know them sort of by training against them? Um, yeah, I mean, once you once you step in there, you know, they're all, they're all a great bunch um, the first team, so it's it's quite easy to just um, to go in there and and you just I think it's just a belief thing. I think once you're in there, you know you got to believe you can um, you can perform well and and do your job there. So yeah, no, I think it was um, you get to know all the boys anyway. Like once you once you go on away trips and you know, you're around them a lot more, you get to know them a lot more. So so yeah, no, they're a, they're a really good bunch down there though. So we we've interviewed Will Nightingale and um, he's a friend of the show. So we yeah. I, I basically I asked him if he oh, had so, sorry to interrupt, but friend of the show and known hater of Watford. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everyone hates Watford. Everyone hates Watford. <laughs> Ryan, you hate Watford, right? Apparently so. Now on this show, I do, don't I? So Good I'm man. not going to argue with it. I'm not going to argue with it. Good man. <laughs> um, I messaged Will earlier today to see if he had any dirt on you, 
And um, to be fair, Will refused because he think he thought you had more dirt on him, so he didn't want to stitch himself up. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, good. Yeah. But he said he said he really enjoyed, it and he said wish you all the best. Obviously, I know you're in touch and stuff. But yeah, out of curiosity, when you were when you were um, training, if you were together in the training, who who passed off Bayo first? Sure. I don't really, you, 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 really, you, can, you can't really pass him off. I mean, he he obviously he backs himself against anyone, so he he'd love to come and try and beat up the young lads, uh, Bayo. So no, nah, he was he was brilliant though because it was a it's a learning curve when you come up against uh, someone like that. I mean, we talk about like the physicality of that league, and there was obviously no one better to come up against than than him so yeah no it was you can't really pass off we'll we'll like to battle me and will so you know i think we we relish playing against someone like that in training so it stood us in good stead like stood you in good stead for making your first team debut now if i remember correctly your actual yeah. official debut came it was a substitute appearance wasn't it yeah yeah away at dagenham yeah that's correct yeah Dagenham. how long were you on the pitch for that night which if i remember again <laughs> wasn't a great night for us no so I think I think I got on about the seventy eighth minute, the seventy ninth was around there. I think we were four nil down, weren't we? Yeah. So and I do just remember the because we sent there was a couple of young lads. He sent us all out for a warm up. I got called back and he said just gonna I'm gonna stick you on. So yeah, no, it was obviously a, a real good moment um, in my career personally. But obviously the day wasn't great. But it was something that will that will stay with me for the rest of my life, making my professional debut there. Do you think you got that run out for, as you say, about 15 minutes or so, with, yeah. Neil, with the intention that you were going to be then starting the next game? Um, to be fair, I wasn't actually, I wasn't too aware that I'd be starting the next game. It was only until, because um, I played, and then I played on the Tuesday um, for the under-21s, and I remember Coxie told me, was telling uh, Reevesy to, to bring me off, Um Around about the 60 minute mark, I come off, like, and then like, there was a couple of little murmurs going around that I might play, but I, you don't really, don't really listen to it too much. And then I got the call on Friday um, when, we, when we were in training. Remember, Neil Hardy just said, "I'm going to play you." So, so yeah, no, it was it was brilliant though. But on that, on the Monday, though, I didn't have a clue that I'd be playing on the weekend. It's interesting you mentioned um, Coxie there because. Um... Neil, obviously Nick and I sponsor players and I, I sponsor Coxie's kit for a couple of years now. So yeah. I was, I was being noticed today. I did say we had Ryan Swinney um, interviewing and um, I said to Coxie, of course, he taught you everything he knew to get you to where you are now, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. How, how good was it in turn? All seriousness, we're sort of having um, Neil Cox and also Adam Reeves sort of centre half sort of play premiership. Did you, are you like a sponge? Do you like to sort of get as much information as you can from them too? Yeah, no, it was, um, it's, it's brilliant to be fair because I'd have, I had a lot to learn when I stepped up from the the under eighteens. I mean, it's it's a different world going from under eighteens into the sort of the first team the first team mix. So, I mean, it was it was it was you couldn't learn enough off them to. I mean, every every day I was learning I was learning something new, and then as long as I could just kind of put that into practicing games and. I knew I'd have uh, half a chance playing the first team because they're they're very they're very good, you know, um, with what they do. You know, they show you little tricks and like little things to use using games. You know, especially um, you know them playing in the Premiership. You know, it's the, you know the best league in the world. So so yeah, no, obviously you know to, for their their help and everything they've done for me, I couldn't really thank them enough for what they've to what they turned me into because you know I had to become at that point I had to become a League Two centre off because that was the league we're in. So, so yeah, no, it was um, it was really, really good. You know what the things they taught me. So yeah, it was brilliant. So was it in terms of when they worked with you? Was it a case that you needed to look? Was it positional play? Was it sort of that sort of sense? Yeah, do, do you know it was put, it was it was a lot of it was actually quite a few things. Um, you know, obviously there's the positional sense, but and then I think the biggest thing was probably me uh, winning headers. Um, because uh, you, you probably obviously well know, um, in, especially in League Two, there's a lot of balls like pump forward, you know, and you need your, your back four, your centre half to stand up and and try and like head them back down the pitch and, and things like that. So yeah, when I was um, in training again, that's another thing. You know, I couldn't really play against better players in terms of uh, Bayo, you know, you know, coming up against someone so strong and so good in the air, you know, I had to really stand up and be counted. So when I kind of coming up against him. And maybe like winning 
in the header and, you know, doing well against him. It, when I was going into games against other players, you know, it felt like a lot easier. So, so you know, it was, it was quite a few things, you know, and I learned, I learned a lot of Coxie and Ruzi in terms of um, defensive, against yeah, defensive player. Yeah. What were your movements then in the summer? You obviously joined yeah. Stoke. Were there rumours of clubs coming in for you or were you expecting, um, you heading into the pre-season, expecting to be staying at Wimbledon for a, a year in League One or? Yeah, no, to be fair, I wasn't, I wasn't too sure what was going on. I think I knew Stoke were had a bit of interest in me, but it didn't it didn't bother me at all. You know, if if I'd stayed at Wimbledon, I'd have been perfectly happy. You know, I loved it down there. Um, so yeah, no, I've done my pre season. I worked hard, you know, and then when the when the time came, it 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 just happened quite fast when when it came around, and then yeah, that was it really. So. So when you spoke to Stoke, who did you speak? Did you speak to their first, Did you speak to Mark Hughes, or was it part of their academy? Who did you speak to to get a deal through? Yeah, I spoke to um, Mark Cartwright actually um, down there, and he deals with the sort of the things that happened. And then the day I signed, I spoke to Mark Hughes as well. Um, so yeah, you know, when, when it happened, I was it was more through um, through my agent, um, him getting it sorted. And things like that. So when the deal will come through, really, and then we went up there. Yeah, I met everyone. So yeah, no, it was it was good. What were your first impressions of Stoke and, and the manager? Yeah, um, it's obviously it's a, it's a massive, it's a huge change. Um, you know, um, when you like see these sort of players they got down here, and then you train with them, you think like it's it's weird that you watch them on on telly all the time, and then you all of a sudden train with them. So no, it's um, yeah, no, it's it's been really good to be fair. You know the managers um he, he, sp- he spoke to me you know which i thought was really good the day i signed um seemed like he's a like, really nice like, nice man he's like obviously a very good manager so hopefully i can um i can keep progressing like i have been maybe where uh, one day and get a shot at the at the first team down here so what's your schedule like at the moment then you're training four days a week who are you training yeah, with yeah yeah um, it, it mixes to be fair. I mean, I've been with the, the under twenty threes, and and if the first team need you for training, you'll go up and um, you train with them. But um, yeah, obviously it depends on what what days you got games and and things like this. This week, we'll, we've got a game um, next Monday, so we'll have Wednesday and Saturday off, um, and then play obviously next Monday and train all the other days. So yeah, no, it's, um, it is a busy schedule. You know, the days are obviously longer as well here. Um, but no, no, it's something I'm, I'm adapting to and I'm, I'm really looking forward to all of it that's coming up. Are you working quite closely with Glenn Hodges? Day-to-day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Glenn, yeah, he's... Um, I'm working closely with him and, and he's obviously... I've had chats with him, like what things he wants me to do and work on. Um, but no, he's um, he's brilliant, you know. He's, uh, he's, 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 he's a tough manager. Like, you know, if something needs to be said, he, he will say it and he demands a lot of his players. So, obviously, uh, working under him, I'm going to improve again and hopefully I can kick on So how have you found the difference in because obviously you're playing the under 23s at the moment so I'm looking at terms of last picture was 2-1 reverse against Fulham Yeah uh, on Saturday How are you finding because obviously bearing in mind you played sort of League 2 level you played under 21s against some sort of bigger size like Bournemouth etc had their, had their yeah. 21s in there How have you found the difference in standard of you're playing against and probably also what you're playing with yeah, it's um, it's a, it's another. It's a, in terms of that, it's another step up. You know, the I think the players, you know, they're very good technically. Most of them, you know, a lot of them do play like international and for good international sides. And it's you know, it's is another step up because the the change in in football now. You know, a lot of teams want to want to pass it and move it. Um, obviously, whereas I'm maybe used to getting maybe a lot more balls in the air and and trying to get down the sides of me. So, yeah, and obviously it's a it's a change that I've got to adapt to. Um, obviously, it's gonna it's gonna take a bit of time for me to to adapt and things. But yeah, I think I'm gonna I'm, I'll be all right, and hopefully I can with a bit of hard work and and just again like listening to the coaches. I hope I can kick on even more now. Now. Ryan, many people have commented to me about the fact that you don't seem to stop growing. <laughs> have you measured yourself up against Peter Crouch yet? Height wise, not I mean. not yet. No, but I, I can tell you one thing: he does tower over me. He's a <laughs> he's very very tall, uh, Crouch. So yeah, no, nah, um, I can say what well, I'm nowhere near as tall as him. I can I can tell you that. 
You'd still fancy to beat them to a header, though, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, you always got to back yourself. <laughs> but I'll probably let him have it in front of me, though. In terms of the 23, so they're playing on Monday night. So where do they where do they play their games, Stoke? Uh, League Town, League Town is is down up. But obviously, um, on Saturday we played at the the first team stadium, so I think they try and get a couple of games in there as well. So. so, also, I see that you were in the Checker Trade Trophy, which obviously done the twenty threes event of this year. Um, yeah. So, uh, first game I believe was against Bradford, wasn't it? Um, which you didn't exactly yeah. get off. Are you hoping to get some games in? On that yeah, level? yeah. Hopefully, I mean, I think it was um, there was a first team player um, that needed game time in my position. Um, so I, just, I I was on the bench that game, but I think we were very unlucky to lose it. We played really well against Bradford. So um, um, yeah, no, hopefully um, we can uh, we can I can get some more games. Obviously, it's a real good learning curve for for all the for all the lads in that in the twenty three. You know, to play come up against first teams and like see what it's like to play against sort of like League One, League Two sides. So. No, no, hopefully I can get um, in the coming games and get some more minutes out of my belt. I can't let you go before just asking some sneaky questions. Who were, when you were at Wimbledon, who were the jokers in the first team? Who made you really laugh? Danny Bullman. That, mm. gee, that guy is, um, he's got to be one of the funniest people I've ever met, <laughs> to be fair. Um, there's a couple, to be fair. I think Jake Reeves, he liked to, he made me laugh, to be fair. He was a, he's a really good lad. Um, but yeah, no, I'd probably have to go with uh, Bully I'd have to go with Bully cool who were the best trainers in terms of training who did you put the most effort in do you reckon um, I thought I'd probably go with um, Baz Fuller um, Paul Robinson you know I think it's not it's not a really a, a surprise when I go out and see them like performing like 8 out of 10 every week 9 out of 10 because the way they, especially Robbo, um, you know, you'd always see him in the gym after training, you know, doing it, doing a bit. Um, you know, Baz is the same. It's, you know, the way they go about things is is really good. You know, as obviously in training, I could learn a lot of them. Um, but yeah, no, they were probably my sort of best trainers, yeah. And finally, who, in one one person, who was the best, the best dress sense? And equally, who had the worst dress sense? <laughs> Best dress sense. Um, job. You know, obviously, in training, not coming with with bully again. You know, <laughs> he um, he loved it. You know, he'd come in with the old sunglasses and all the shirts on. So yeah, no, I'll probably go with bully. Worst dress sense. So if you ask Bash this, he'd, he'd definitely say me. Uh, I don't know. I don't know who'd go with least. Tom Beer, he loved the tracks that he did, Tom Beer. So. <laughs> Very casual, yeah. <laughs> yeah, loved it. But I'm not sure if you've cottoned on yet, Sweetie, that Stoke's biggest rivals, apart from Port Vale, obviously, is a big rival there. Second biggest rivals are Watford. So I think all the Stoke fans would really love to hear from you ahead of their Premier League fixture just how much you would really hate Watford and want to beat them <laughs> this season. <laughs> We want to win every game, but obviously a rival game, we'd, uh, <laughs> we'd obviously want to win it. So, Are you getting so, a lot of media yeah. training at Stoke? Because that, that is a proper professional footballer's answer. No sell it. No sell it. <laughs> no, no, don't say anything that could no, get you in no. trouble like, further down the line. <laughs> Before we can let you go, as you are getting to we do have... I like that. Um, we do have five quick fire questions. Very quick, either right. or questions... We'd like to choose one or the other from the following list. That sound okay? Yep, cool. Okay, so if you had to live with one of these for the rest of your life, would you choose to have your hair bleached neon green or to have a face tattoo? The, the neon green. You'd go for the neon green hair? I would, yeah. Okay, okay. Would you rather run at 100 miles an hour or fly at 10 miles an hour? Run at 100 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Would you rather have crayons for fingers or lollipop sticks for toes? Lollipop sticks for toes. Interesting, interesting. Would you rather have as a pet an elephant-sized pug or a pug-sized elephant? The elephant-sized pug. You took a lot of time to think about that one. Elephant-sized pug? Yeah, no. <laughs> you, you'd have to buy yeah, a house where it could fit. 
when you get that house sorted, you make sure you've got room for an elephant-sized pug. The big old pug, yeah. That's huge, yeah. And um, last question, would you rather go to dinner with Michelle Keegan or Kevin Keegan? Michelle Keegan, has to be. Good answer. <laughs> Stu chose Kevin Keegan, but, yeah. <laughs> Joe, these questions are getting funnier. <laughs> Joe, we do this to, we do this to every guest. I think do we did Will answer these questions as well? We did we did stitch Will up, didn't we? Will we Will Nightingale had similar questions, either or questions. Maybe not quite as random as these ones. They Maybe, were very random. They, they were yeah. a bit of randomness on this show. Um, <laughs> Will did did choose, of course, famously Watford ahead of Luton though, so hmm. or did Yeah. You? But Ryan, uh, thank you very much for your time. No worries. This evening. Much appreciated. All no, the best for the no, rest of the season with Stoke. Thank you, yeah, you too. Obviously, I still speak to quite a lot of the Wimbledon lads, so no, I'll always look out for results, so I'll be keeping in touch. Well, thankfully, we're doing a bit better. Well, I'll say a bit better. We've won one game, so that's always positive. <laughs> That'll be all right. I'll be flying soon. be flying soon. Will, thanks for joining us. Um, sorry, Ryan, thanks for joining us. <laughs> sorry. Uh, this all about Will. I can't wait to ask. Um, <laughs> thanks for joining us, and um, yeah, I hope Stoke will do well, and hope you sort of um, break your way in. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that. I enjoyed it. Ryan Sweeney, there obviously internet connections up north. I've only they're a fairly new sort of thing. They're sort of getting used to this. Like they had colour TVs, I think about five years ago. Now in Stoke on Trent, they finally got the internet. So maybe a little bit patchy in places, but a fantastic interview with Ryan. A great long chat we had with him. There was so, we talked for so long, in fact, that we couldn't fit it all in this week. So if you keep an eye on our website, 9YRSpodcast, or keep an eye on our social media, we'll announce it on there. All the extra bits from our conversation we're going to upload in the week as well. But top man, top man is Ryan. Good lad. Very much enjoyed that. And appearing tonight on... And here's your host on Terry Wogan. Blankety Blank Stew. I've been thinking for Dominic Polion, this might be a better song for him on the terrace than the one we've got for him. We sing his name to the Blankety Blank tune. Really? Probably not, but I'd, I'm more likely sing that than I will the current song. Thing is, you do know now that I'm going to quite happily sing the song now for Don Polion every time we're together on a terrace. Knock yourself out. It's fine. Great. <laughs> I'm happy for you. I won't be listening. Dominic Polion himself is very fickle because he keeps moving to different football stadiums around the country every week for the purposes of a podcast game that I'm not entirely sure he's actually aware we do. But anyway. <laughs> when he does, he's going to love it, isn't he? He is going to love it. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to play it with him one day. We are. We we're are. I will make sure I... we do this. I will sort it out. I will stalk him for half a season and then we'll do it. Yeah? Great. Lyle Taylor will just be pleased that you're not stalking him anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't need to stalk him anymore. Last week, Dom travelled up to Grimsby. So this week, he's sort of stayed around that area. He's not travelled too far away anyway. So your first clue, Stu, is he's travelled about 30 miles away from Grimsby. Um, Trying to think of the Grimsby area now. Where are we? We're looking uh, 30 miles. Will bring us probably. I don't know, to be fair. I'm trying to look at a map, but I can't even think where he is. Okay, well, I'll give you a second clue. He's looking on his GPS on his rented car, because obviously last week he got the train up to Grimsby, so he's had to rent a car, hasn't he? Clearly, for continuity reasons. And he's noticed that he's a bit of a. He likes a little bit of wordplay, does Dom. You know, he's a big fan of Countdown and sort of the word wheels in the newspaper. He's worked out that an anagram of the name of this stadium is Grand Rap Folk. Grand Rack Folk. Rap Folk. Rap folk. Yeah, not a rap as in So Solid Crew, not as in Southern Fried Chicken Rap. I ain't got a clue. Okay, well, I think you might get it on this second one. I've been a bit obscure with my first couple because I think the, third, the final clue will give it away. Cool. He thinks, having entered the stadium... He thinks the stadium is looking a bit tatty, you know, a bit out of date, a bit outdated, but apparently it was built less than 30 years ago. In fact, the stadium was opened in 1988. Open in 1988? Mm. Where the hell is... I can't think where... 
can't... Hmm, new stadiums, 1980. No, you've done me this one. I haven't got a clue. I'll give you one last opportunity. It is the oldest of the new stadiums. Yeah, well, it has to be in 1988. Yeah. Um, so we've done Derby. Bolton was at that far... Oh, up that way... Nah, I can't think. I'll give you one last clue. <laughs> Part of the spelling of this team's name is what I might describe a supporter of Watford. A supporter... Well, to be fair, there's a lot of names that you may it's tell him. Sevilla. Uh, it's not Leicester, is it? The Walker Stadium. But what part of the spelling of Leicester <laughs> would I call a Watford fan that would be rude? No, I've seen it in the Walker Stadium. <laughs> but what part of that would be... Well, the W word, I... <laughs> but that's not in the spelling. It's the Walker... It's not the... The L's not an N. <laughs> wow. oh, I don't know. Put me out of misery. Uh, I'm going to have to put my... I'm, I don't like this game anymore. Put you know myself that. out of my misery and <laughs> the listeners out there as well, I think. It is Scunthorpe United, Stu. It's Glanford Park. Oh. To be fair, you're right. That is up that way, isn't it? <laughs> no, I made it up. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's totally the opposite end of the country from Gimby. <laughs> yeah, but Scumfort is just... Oh, I've been there as well. That even more concerns me. It was a really good clues, though, really. We're moving on. We're moving on. We're horrendously <laughs> overrunning anyway, so let's move on quickly. <laughs> and Coventry this week. We'll look ahead quickly to Shrewsbury because we don't know what to expect from Coventry other than we expect it's going to be a bottom of the table clash because they are rock bottom at time of recording. Shrewsbury Town, though, first. Got a bit of a mixed record against them. They are currently 22nd in the league. Um, one away win so far, so they have one on the road. They did that at Oldham. They won 3-2. They have one less point than our good selves. But between us, we have only managed one clean sheet each. So expect goals. Now I've said that, expect a nil-nil. <laughs> you just jinxed it, yeah. Mm. Yeah, do you know what? Form wise, they're terrible, aren't they? Um, I'm looking through their squad. It's not. It's not. The, there's a few players that we we remember in terms of. You got Junior Brown, who's done the rounds everywhere, isn't he? To be fair, yeah, most famously Fleetwood, wasn't he? Yeah, he was at Fleetwood. Um, used to have really ridiculous hair. Mm. Um, I don't think he has now. I think he's realised that it's not very good. Um, Ivan Tony, who's on loan from Newcastle, was yeah. at Northampton. Um, more a few than either season. Yeah, Andy Mangan, who we've we've come up a number of times, but nothing. It's not really. And they've got also AJ Lech. I think it's got a double barrel name, isn't he? Lech Smith, who was a crew forward. Mm-hmm. Um, but nothing. I suppose it seems pretty that last year we would have gone quite as a decent forward line, but after what we've faced this year, that's not the most you know impressive forward line against us. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I think we've we've got um, you know turn the corner against Charlton. We've got to now go in and um, really have a good first half um, and go in and really have a go at them because then they're, they're going to be low on confidence. Like I say, their recent form is is not great. So um, yeah, it's one of the games we've got. You know, we've got if you think about it now, we've got. Home to Shrewsbury, away to bottom place, currently bottom place Coventry. Um, we've got to be looking at picking up three, six points at the moment. Predictions can be added, as we say, to the Ask a Prediction League at wwwneils wfc Sorry. Someone's going to accuse me of having poor grammar. Niels wfc-site.co.uk forward slash APL2. Now, the reason I highlight this now is because guess what happened last week, Stu? No, go on. I got my first four pointer. Of the season with well my done. two-one prediction for the Charlton game. Wow! I never, I would never have gone for that. I was feeling very optimistic on the morning of the game. Seventy minutes in, less so. But there we go. So, if you want to add your predictions for the upcoming games, please, please, please do so. Join a number of Don's fans taking part in that. Updates from both games will be available on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram at 9YRS Podcast. And a further look and a further preview of the Coventry game, keep an eye out on our social media as well for that. With that Coventry game being on a Wednesday night, for reasons I'm still not aware of, we're going to be releasing the podcast next week on Friday. We did this once before, just so we can give you a rundown of what happened at the Rico Arena, still called that I think. We're going to move our podcast to Friday. So just if you wake up on Thursday morning and your podcast has not been delivered to iTunes yet, do not panic. It will be on Friday.
Before we go this week, just a reminder, if you are interested for standing for election for the Don's Trust Board, the nominations will shortly be open. Keep checking the website, www.thedonstrust.org. The Don's Trust Web Jam as well is up and running, so make sure if you are a Don's Trust member, check your email if you haven't signed up yet. Thank you very much, Stu. Thank you. Brings us to the end of this week's show. I think we've plugged pretty much everything we need to plug. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know the drill by now, at 9YRS Podcast. If you're listening on iTunes, thank you very, very much. A five-star rating and review would be greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we'll be joined by Wimbledon fan Mel Gid... 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 Mel from Mel and Sue to discuss some show she's on that's moving to Channel 4. Don't ask us why she's on our podcast next week, but it's all everyone is talking about, so we thought we might as well join in. We'll see you then.